We're here to show you that maths is more than just numbers. Maths is used for many things, including solving crimes. We will show you by explaining a couple of maths concepts used in criminal investigations. On the 2nd of July 2016, Maya Brown was murdered. It is up to the police to solve this crime with the assistance of maths. We have narrowed down our investigation to four suspects, one of whom we believe did shoot Maya Brown and callously leave her at the scene to bleed to death. Upon finding the gun left at the crime scene, we promptly dusted it for fingerprints. All of our suspects are known criminals and are already in the police database, so we are hopeful that the print left in the gun barrel will be a match. As everyone already knows, fingerprints are no use without a suspect, and the maths in a fingerprint is that no two fingerprints are the same. This is patterns. The collection of tiny patterns on your fingers can identify one person out of billions. Look closely at your thumb. You can see the curved lines that look a bit like one big line creating a spiral, but actually is very different. There are lines that cut across others or split into two lines. There are names like loop, arch, or a wall for the patterns making up your fingerprint. Now the maths. We have a fingerprint match when enough of these detailed patterns match and we want as many matches as possible so that the chance of mistaken identity is very unlikely. We are looking for say one in a million billion chances of being mistaken. We use mathematical models to predict the chance this small with around 12 matches of patterns. When we hear someone say they're absolutely certain two fingerprints match, it means we have found about 12 or more matching patterns. Fortunately for us, we only have a small number of suspects to check the print we found against. So there is less chance of a mistake as there would be if we checked it against a huge database of, say, 200 million. After we examined the body, we found that the victim had been shot in the chest and there was an exit wound on her back. Again, with maths, we will now look at the angle the bullet entered her body, left her body and lodged itself in the wall, so we can gain even more information about what occurred. As we have three holes made by the same bullet, we should be able to work out the path of the bullet and the firing position of the murderer. We can use the Pathfinder Multiple Laser Trajectory Kit. This kit is designed to provide accurate projectile trajectories at crime scenes such as this one. The laser is positioned at the wall, the final destination of the bullet, and the positioned on the same angle as the bullet was lodged into the wall. Using a dummy with holes mirroring the angles of exit and entry points of the bullet from the victim, the laser beam is angled through the holes. From this, we can get a baseline view of where bullet was fired from. To do this, we are using the angle and location of the bullet of each impact and the height of the victim, including shoes, if any, to determine the murderer's position and distance from the victim. The entry point of the bullet and its path through the victim's body enables us to determine the angle of the bullet, especially as the bullet was not deflected by any bone in the body. We know the murderer was reasonably close to the victim because of the entry wound and the pounder markings and estimate them to be three metres away. Using angle of the bullet and its path in our mathematical equations, we believe the bullet was fired following an angle of depression of 15 degrees. Comparing the entry and exit wounds of the bullet, we know that another 5 degrees of depression occurred going through the body before hitting the wall. Using the 117 centimetres height of the victim and the 15 degree angle of depression, as well as the speed of the bullet and the 3 metre distance from the victim, we can calculate the approximate height of the murderer. Again, we do this using maths knowledge and equations. Using the mathematician in our ballistics lab, the murderer is said to be 80 centimetres taller than the victim. 197 centimetres tall. We need to know time of death to ascertain which of our suspects have an alibi. For this we use science, Newton's law of cooling and maths. The law of cooling says that the surface temperature of the body changes at a rate proportional to its relative temperature. So that means that we have to look at the difference between the body's temperature and the temperature of the room the body was found in. We use this in a maths equation. Took the body's temperature at 12 o'clock a.m. when the body was found, which was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We use the fact that the average body temperature for a living person is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We measured the room temperature that the body was in, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Two hours after we found the body, the body temperature had dropped to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. We use the law of cooling to find the approximate time of death.
We found that Anna Cook was indeed the murderer and has been charged for a 20-year jail sentence.